teaching in the West and teaching in China. Are the students different? And I thought about that quite a lot, and I've come to this conclusion. The students aren't different at all. There's really no significant difference between a Chinese student and an Australian student or a British student or an American student. There's no difference. What, what is the difference? The difference is the way that they are taught. That's the difference, not the student. If you teach the American students in a particular way, you get one thing. Teach the stu Chinese students a particular way, you get another thing. Right? So no student problem in China. Teacher problem in China. Teacher problem. Right? And the government knows this. And the government's working on this. And, uh, and this is really quite interesting. So I just want to introduce you to three words that we need to be clear about because I'm going to use these words as we go on. And you, you really need to sort of have them as separate, and I don't know whether you do, it's just different teachers' colleges do them in different ways. But the curriculum, the curriculum is what you teach, all right? And pedagogy, how you teach, okay? So we've got what you teach and how you teach, pedagogy. And evaluation, of course, is how you assess. And those arrows there, they're to, to indicate that the three things are always tied in together. They're always tied in together. In, in China at the moment, which is the biggest one? Is it about what you teach or is it about how you teach or is it about evaluation? It's about evaluation. Right? It's about evaluation. It, if, you, if you wanted to improve, I'll tell you something really brave. It's not going to happen, but it'd be really brave. One day, I would hope that a school in China says, we're not having examinations. No more examinations. We're not doing them. Right? That would have a dramatic effect. A dramatic effect. Because, and what would the effect be? Apart from the fact that the students and their parents would all panic, the real effect would be that the teachers would have to say, what on earth do I do now? Teachers would say, gosh, there's no examination, so I don't know what to aim at. Now what do I do? And at that point, your teacher starts to think. Real thinking goes on. Right? And, and that, that would be a really good thing. I, to some extent, I did this in my own university. Because when I got there, they said to me, oh, what would you like to teach, and so forth. And I set it all up. And then they got around to saying, okay, and, and how are we going to assess them, etc. And we got to a point where I said, well, I'm not having an examination. And the university people said, oh, you've got to have an examination. And I said, well, I'm not having one. Said, oh, <laughs> no, what do, you, what do you need? Why do you need an examination, said I. And they sort of talked about this and they said, oh, the administration, the management of the university, when we put in the marks, We've got two columns, right? And you've got to have something in the two columns. I said, that's fine. I can put something in the two columns. It's just that one of them won't be an examination. So they said, oh, you better write about that because we'll have to ask. So I wrote quite a lot about that. And nobody really replied. So I didn't have an examination. And I've been there two years now and I've never had an examination. Okay? Never had an examination. Guess what? Students get taught differently and do different things when they don't have an examination. Right? And they notice it. First of all, they say, oh, great, this is real nice, no examination. And then slowly it dawns on them. They might not have an examination, but they do have tests through the, through the semester. They have tests. They have an early test after a few weeks, and then they have another test, and then they have another test and they've got to work on all of these things, so they actually have to work hard right the way through the course. And they've got to produce things for me that I will actually be able to give them a mark for. And then they discover, they say, oh, we haven't got an examination, but this is hard work. And I smile and say, yes, it's hard work, because this is internal assessment. Right? An examination is an external kind of assessment the end. This is an internal assessment. That makes a big difference. That's a big difference. So if you, if you don't have examinations, 
you, you change the whole approach that you have to take to teaching. Okay. So, curriculum, what you teach, pedagogy, how you teach, and evaluation, how you assess. So what about the progressive teacher? We were asking what makes a good teacher, and now the, 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 the acid is on me. It's over to me to say, what do I think makes a good teacher? And I've got three things that I want to talk about as being absolutely vital if you're going to become a good teacher. All right, if you want to be a good teacher, these are the three things. Understands academic disciplines, develops skills, and reflects three things that you need to do if you're going to be a, a, a progressive teacher or a good teacher. What do teachers need to know? Well, first of all, they need to know about child development. Teachers need to know about child development. We now know that the brain of the child, when the child's brain develops, a big change takes place when the child is seven years of age. When a child becomes seven years of age, roughly, a big, big change takes place in the structure of their brain. Okay? And that change is that the front part, the thinking part of the brain, develops dramatically more. It gets much, much more active, the front part. Up into seven years of age, it tends to be the back part, back part of the little brain developed. After seven, it's the front part. Now, it's really interesting because there's been a lot of research on teaching children things, and people say, oh, we've got to teach them their numbers and their colours, right? And teach them some language, and we do it as early as possible. And even, you know, when children are three and four, they're being taught their numbers and their colours and all this stuff. All the stuff that we teach them, that, that's all called cognitive or thinking stuff. It's all think stuff about that part of the brain. Can I tell you something interesting? I think that's interesting anyway. All that early teaching of numbers and colours and, langu and, and language skills in the formal sense, I don't mean just talking, but language skills in the formal sense, all that stuff if you teach it early to a child, it makes no difference. It makes no difference. Right? And there are countries where the children don't go to school until they're seven, and they get on just as well as all the others. Because the brain isn't ready to learn the academic things until the child is about seven. So if that's the case, all these people that are paying money to have their poor little children taught all this stuff, they're wasting their money. That's the reality of it. Yeah. So, it's to do with the way the brain develops. And, and, and it's to do with when children learn things best. When is the teachable moment? And there's a big change takes place at seven, and you shouldn't be too worried about your child until after seven. It's what they're doing when they're seven, eight, nine, ten, in terms of learning things for um, you know what's called the cognitive part of learning, the thinking part of learning, right? The, the stuff that you get from the books. Uh, that's when that's important. At those ages, not any earlier, not any earlier. It doesn't do any harm to do it earlier. Just doesn't make any positive difference. Okay, so. That's a little bit about child development. Teachers have got to know about that. How students learn, including, for example, language and literacy develop at each age level, you've got to know that. If you've got seven-year-olds, you can't teach them the same way as you teach 10-year-olds. Subject content, you've got to know what it is that you're teaching. I mean, the more you go on in the system, the more important the various subjects become. But you as a teacher, you've got to know about this stuff. You've, you've, got, you've got to be you know, very knowledgeable and have a great deal of, of understanding and indeed qualifications in subject areas. And then lastly, you've got to know many instructional strategies. For example, direct and indirect instruction, experience-based and skill-based approaches, lectures and small group work. You've got to, you've got to have a, a whole set of approaches that you can take. 
So if we look at those, the child development one, the subject is psychology. Students learn, right, language and literacy, again, psychology. Subject content, well, that's the academic disciplines that they teach in universities. That's in mathematics and, and, and French and, and, and history and geography and physics and chemistry and biology and all those things. They're all very important. And, and we need teachers in the primary school who've got a real good understanding of those things, right? So that they can give the right sort of guidance to their children. And you, you, in the old days, you used to think that primary school teachers, they didn't need a lot of education. Well, we don't think that anymore now. A primary school teacher needs as much education as anybody. So the academic disciplines, and then the instructional strategies one, that subject is pedagogy, right? How you teach. That's how you teach. Some people would say pedagogy is a part of psychology, but I don't agree with that. But that's pedagogy. So what do teachers need to know? Those are the things they need to know about. They're the subjects you need to study. And that relates when I said understanding academic disciplines. That's what I meant. Okay? You remember the earlier slide? That's, that's that one. What skills do teachers need? Well, most important one, perhaps, is the ability to diagnose diverse students. Now, by that I mean to take your students, either one at a time or as a group, a class, and find out where they are now, what they know and what they understand and, and, and what their, their, their readiness is to learn the next step. You can't figure out what the next step is for your students unless you know where they are now. So all teaching has got to begin with your assessment of, of, of the readiness of the students. So that's that one. Then having worked out what they're ready for, you've got to diverse, diverse, divert, sorry, devise a program for them, for the specific learners. And then select the news media, like presentations, e-learning, books, whatever. You've got to know how to teach in different modes, lectures, groups, tutorials, distance education, and you've got to time manage and multitask. Okay? So those are your skills, and that's what I meant when I said that on the earlier slide. I meant, meant those things. Okay. And the last one, we'll do this one and then we'll have a little break. It's, it's 10 o'clock now, we'll have a little break for a few minutes and then come back. Uh, the last one reflects. This is the idea of becoming a reflective teacher. A reflective teacher. Remember I said to you before that you, you're the one that's going to have to solve the problems of teaching. I can't do it for you. Nobody can do it for you. Whoops. You're the one that's got to solve those problems. The term that's used for that is that you are a reflective teacher. You are a teacher that thinks about what's going on. You think about what, you're, what you've done in the classroom. You think about what worked. You think about what didn't work. You try and figure out in your own mind what your next little experiment is. What the next thing is that you're going to try. How are you going to do things differently? A lot, of, uh, a lot of teachers find it's helpful to keep a little journal, just to make notes. You know, when you've got a quiet moment after a class or something, just jot down what you think about it. And that will help you to remember and, and to work out what was good and what was bad. But you've got to do it for your class and everybody's going to be different. Your classes are different and you are different, so you can't just learn it from the person next to you. It's got to be you. So if you set out on that path, that you're going to be a reflective teacher. I put a book there, Becoming a Reflective Teacher. There are hundreds and hundreds of books with that, that sort of title. If you look on the internet for the name Reflective Teacher, you'll get heaps and heaps of books. And I'm sure there'll be books in Chinese, but I, I haven't seen them, but there will be uh, on a reflective teacher. This is the idea that you're a thinking teacher. Now, so let's see the literature on this. 
This is absolutely vital. If you want to know how to improve your teaching, this is the way you go. Eh? This is vital. Journals are a good way to start. Also, support groups are good. I, I've worked in schools where I've taken a group of, say, four or five or six teachers, and I've said to you know, the, the teachers that have wanted to improve their teaching, I said, look, there's no point in my doing what I'm doing to you now, just standing here and talking about it. That's not going to do anything. Your teaching is not going to be better tomorrow because you've heard this. Your teaching will be better if you start thinking about it and working on it as the year goes on. And sometimes it's helpful to have a little group of teachers that can meet each week to talk about what's going on in the class. Right? And that's really possibly the strongest way for teacher development at your level, where you are now. So you're out in the classroom, you're busy as I know, you've got heaps to do, more than enough. But if you can get a little group of people together that can be your support group, and you can try to think about it and talk to your friends about it in this group on a regular basis. It's got to be regular. It's got to be once a week. You've got to timetable it in and do it. Okay? Some people like to do it with lunch on Saturday or something. You have a lunch and we'll talk about it. And that's going to be our teaching time. And, and people quite like that. So you need that as a kind of strategy to help you. So what does the reflective teacher talk about? Well, that didn't come out very well, did it? Teacher reflection. Starting at the bottom. When you first start doing this, you, do, you talk about technical things. The words here are technical, contextual, and dialectic. And don't worry about what they mean. Contextual, oops, contextual there, dialectic there, and technical there. So when you start talking about your teaching practice in your little group, you start talking about these things. You start talking about teaching methods, and you start talking about resources, what you've got to use in the classroom. All teachers are worried about resources. And you start teaching, talking about that. Later on, you start talking about the needs of students and alternative practices, different ways. And then last of all, you start thinking about moral things and social things. Uh, you sort of go up. But to, to go up that kind of hierarchy, I mean, we're talking a year or two years or even three years there. I mean, when you start talking about your teaching practice, you're going to be talking about methods and resources maybe alternative practices, then you'll get on to thinking about the needs of the student. Okay. We'll have a little break and then we'll come back to, to that. Alright? Is that a good idea? You want a little break? Yes. I thought you might. <laughs> okay. Alright. How long do you have when you have a break here? Five minutes? Ten minutes? Five minutes. Let's have a boat. Good Western thing. Let's have a vote. If you want five minutes, put up a hand. If you want ten, put up a hand. So five minutes, put up your hand. Ten minutes, put up a hand. Ooh! Okay, we'll have ten minutes. So that'll be, well, it'll be twenty past. That'll be, yeah. Well, twenty past by that clock. Okay? Alright, time to have a stretch.